Uh, have you ever missed an excellent opportunity in your life simply because you were running late or maybe came to the event unprepared or even chose not to show up at all? We have many who are getting ready to graduate within a few weeks. But graduation does not mean the end. Some are thinking about college. With that, they're looking for avenues to make sure that they can go to college, looking for scholarships and grants. <clears throat> now, suppose a student had an opportunity to receive a grant. Their grades were good. They were in the right amount of after-school activities. They had great leadership potential. All they had to do was submit an essay about what they want to do with their life <clears throat> and have it in by April 23rd. It is now April 24th, and they have not written that essay. And even though they may be the greatest essay composition writer that there is, because they missed the deadline, they missed the opportunity for scholarship and grants. Well, not only students, but how about you in your job? Maybe you've had an opportunity where you and a few others were considered as for a raise. Not only a raise, but a promotion. Only one person would get it, but there's at least three or four of you who are vying. Out of the four of you, you are the highly favored. Even amongst the candidates, they realize you're going to get the position. The day that the promotion is given, it goes to the guy next to you, not you. Why? Because when they were doing the interviews, you answered all the questions correctly. You had the greatest work record, work ethic, but you arrived one minute late. One minute. You missed an opportunity to be months. We've all had that happen in our lives, where for whatever reason, because of tardiness or being unprepared, we lost out on a grand opportunity. But what if that grand opportunity was a divine opportunity? Would you dare come late? Would you come unprepared? Or would you just fail to come at all? The disciple Thomas did miss a divine blessing. For a whole week, the other ten disciples had received a great blessing in seeing and knowing their resurrected Lord on the night of the encounter. And Thomas chose to stay away. And before I continue... Natalie, I forgot. Could you come forward and read the scripture for us? I was trying not to miss my divine appointment. I screwed her out of her list. <laughs> Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he, he said this, he showed them his hands inside. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thank you. Do I get your forgiveness? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thomas did miss this great divine blessing 
when which the other disciples had, they met and Jesus came, revealed himself in the resurrected form. But Thomas had chose to stay away. Before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed for his disciples. He prayed that God would protect them and unite them. And he even told the twelve that he would see them again shortly. Yes, the crucifixion was a devastating blow to the plans of the disciples. They had great ideas of what Jesus was going to do. But despite the crucifixion, they were to remain together and wait for the Lord. Instead of seeking the companionship of his fellow disciples, Thomas chose to stay away and remain in a state of melancholy. While the other ten bolstered and curdled each other due to their numbers and unity, Thomas chose to brood in a corner by himself and hug tightly to his despair. In doing so, he lost what they got, a visit by the resurrected Jesus. Even after the other disciples had reported Thomas what they had witnessed in Jesus' appearance, Thomas chose to live in denial. It is reported, as Natalie read to us, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers there where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas was in a state of shock that Jesus was dead. In Thomas' mind, Jesus was no more. The severity of the crucifixion made it almost impossible for Thomas to think of his consequences as being reversed. Thomas had abandoned all hope. The compelling evidences that his senses had convinced him that the pierced side and wounded hands indicated that this type of death was not going to see the reversal. It was not going to see life. Now it is true that eight days later, Thomas did meet the risen Lord. <coughs> but those were eight days of missed blessing. The ten had hope because of seeing Jesus. But Thomas, he had despair. The ten had joy, while Thomas had grief. The ten had fellowship, while Thomas had isolation. The ten had a reassuring faith, while Thomas had questioning uncertainties. Yes, Thomas would one day gain faith, fellowship, joy, and hope, but those were eight days he could have had if he had only been present. Those were eight days he could never get back. Thomas leaves himself and us with this question of what if? What if he did meet with the disciples on that first encounter? What would his life have been like on those eight days? Would he be full of joy? Would he be exuberant? Would his demeanor of grief be gone? What would have been? What if? What if? But Thomas is not alone. And there is another story in the Bible that ends on a positive note. <clears throat> but it causes us as readers to ask a similar question. What more could have been? Not what if, but what more could have been? The story is found in 2 Kings 4. And involves the prophet Elisha, a widow, and her two sons. There was a common history between the family and Elisha because the husband of the widow was part of Elisha's prophetic guild. But her husband had died. And sometime after her husband had died, this widow sought the man of God whom she knew. Their family had acquired much debt, but had no means to pay. According to the legal system of that day, she could not just go and claim bankruptcy. Since she had no means to repay, there was only one thing she could do. She would have to give up her two sons as indentured servants to the creditors until the debt was paid. To give up her sons. She already lost her husband. Now to give up her sons. This weighed heavy upon her, and therefore she sought the man of God on how this could be fixed. 
Elisha asked her to consider. Look, throughout your household, what do you have of value in your home? She could only produce a small container of oil. By the terminology used, there is evidence, we're not talking about cooking oil, we're not cooking about lamp oil, but anointing oil. And the language also conveys that the small container was not like my fishbowl over here. It was more of a flask. Small, compact. But Elisha instructed her to go and borrow as many vessels, large containers as she could. Large, small, get as many vessels as you can. Go, as he says specifically in Kings, go from Find these vessels from everywhere you can, from all your neighbors. This was a call by the prophet to commit herself in faith to God's provision. Not only did she act in faith, but she also had to do so in the face of many awkward questions and puzzling looks. As she went from door to door asking her neighbors, Do you have in any empty vessels I can use? Why? What are you going to do with them? Hang up my dicks. After collecting as many as she and her sons could find, they went into their home and closed the door behind them and began to pour the oil from the flask. Small little flask, container say as big as this table. Kept filling, filling. Boys, bring me another one. This, this, this container's full. Cool. Another. It filled. I still have more. Keep bringing in. We don't know the exact number she brought in. But finally she cried out one last time, bring me another. We have no more. With that, when that last container she had was filled, the flask became empty. God had provided. Here is maybe where your questioning mind might enter. Mine did. What if the widow and her sons had kept looking before they started pouring? How much more would God have provided? Would God merely stop with maybe just say one more vessel? Well, what happens if the boys had got 10 or 50 more? Would God have stopped? The widow and her sons we're reaching out to what God had promised in faith. And what God says is what you ask for and show that you're ready to receive, I will pour myself out. So whether it be one more, ten more, fifty more, or even if they could find a thousand more, God would have filled every single vessel. That is our God. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So he's going to be able to fill ten thousand or a thousand containers of oil. I'm not sure what anyone's going to do with a thousand containers of oil. I guess there's going to be a lot of anointings. Um, but God could do it. God is ready and willing. But not only was she blessed in this process, God had used this widow to be a blessing to others. Yes, she did have the oil. This way, she could make sure her sons were not sold in the servanthood. She could not so pay back the creditors. She had surplus to live off of from the sale of that oil. She was taken care of, but she also blessed the creditors. They had someone who paid their debts. They also blessed the community. A surplus of oil which can be used when there is a time of need. And she isn't just giving the cheap oil. This is oil produced by God, and God never gives second best. This is the finest, purest oil. She also blessed the community not only with the oil, but by seeing the hand of God at work in her midst. They may not have seen what she was doing behind those closed doors, but when they knew she went in, she was only carrying a flask. Now she's carrying out all their containers, which were empty, now filled with oil. 
God is doing a mighty thing, and the people were invited to participate. This is a great story, but stories which are nice are nothing if they don't have a lesson. They're meaningless. So what are some lessons we can take from the widow, as well as Thomas? One truth is that we need to heed is that the measure in which you desire God is the measure you have God. If you only want God a little in your life, well, he's not going to push his way into your life. He will give you what you're asking for. If you only desire a small portion of God, you are robbing yourself, though, of a great blessing. What if the widow had simply gathered five containers? Would her actions demonstrate that she really wanted God to intervene? Or was she expecting the answer to her problem to come from somewhere else, like maybe Elisha? Luckily for her and for us, she wanted God on a grand scale. She went from neighbor to neighbor, household to household, whether she knew him or not. I need your vessel. I need your container. I want God to do something to save my boys. She wanted God. It did not matter to her what looks and questions she got from the public. All she knew is that she had to do all God wanted her to do, and God would provide. When God is wanting to use us and bless you, how much and how willing are you allowed to meet with God? How much? How are you saying, God, answer my little request? God says, I'm going to give you this. Why are you asking for this? I'll give you that, but you're asking too small. Another truth is that we must not only be wishing to see God, but diligently pursuing. Merely wishing gets us nothing. But pursuing God gets us God and all that he has to offer. What steps are we taking to meet this God? What steps are we doing now so that we are prepared when we do meet with God? Are you prepared to receive all that he has to offer you when you do meet with him? Wishing will get you nowhere. Pursue and prepare to meet. And a third truth is, if we want to see great things done in our lives, we must be the ones who do the work. The widow had the need. She could have simply expected, Elijah, you go get the oil, you go get the vessels. But no. She is the one who needed God, not Elisha. Elisha could have done the work, but the fact would have Change. The widow would now become dependent upon Elisha and not upon God. Her faith would have been not stretched, only Elisha's. If we try to pass the call that God is placing in our lives to do something great for him, and we're going, no, that's not me. But you're also passing on the blessing he wants to give you. Let someone else do the work. I just want the blessing. No, in order to get the blessing, do the work. Another truth which we can see, which hinted already, is that our prayers might be just way too small. We sometimes receive little blessings simply because we do not pray big prayers. The widow offered prayers in the form of the number of containers. How many containers can I get? God, I want you to fill. You said you're going to supply. I'm offering a big prayer. All of these containers. Fill them. And God answered. In the same vein, though, another truth can be learned. God does not simply allow his blessings to flow haphazardly. The oil, as it got near to the top of the container, the widow knew that this was a blessing from God and she relished. She was not going to let it overflow. God does not allow his blessings to just go willy-nilly. It's there for a purpose. So she had to raise the flask each time it got near to the top, in faith, assuming that when she started the next one, there would be oil. Never wasted, 
Never just going splurging all over the place. It was there for a purpose. And when there were no more prepared vessels, the oil stopped. Sometimes we pray that God will pour down blessings upon us. And we expect them to flow from heaven like rain. And all we have to do is just dance out in it and enjoy it. But God's purposes, God's blessings come with a purpose. We have to gather his outpouring. Therefore, we must prepare ourselves, the church and the community, to receive the blessings that God desires to pour out. It's one thing to pray for these blessings. But are you ready to receive? We must be like the farmer who wants to ensure that when the rains come, despite the drought that is going on, there will be water for a long period of time. He will start digging irrigation ditches. He will dig out a pond. He will dig wells without rain cloud in the sky. Maybe his neighbors are laughing at him. You're spending all this time and energy doing all this work, and there's not a drop of water. But the storm clouds do come. When they come, water does come. It rains on both the farmer and his neighbors. The, the neighbors, they get water, but it maybe only lasts a day or two. They have no containers to catch it. It's quickly evaporated, gone within a few days. But the farmer who prepared to receive the blessings from heaven had water for his crops for months, if not years. Are we ready to receive the blessings that we are asking for? Thomas missed out on his blessing. And because of it, he wrestled with that for eight days. He gave in to despair. And there was no joy in his life. If he had remained true with the, to what Christ had promised and prepared himself for the resurrection by staying with the other ten, Thomas would have, not, would have, have known the power of the resurrection as well. Only eight days earlier. We find victory in Christ. But he did not at that time. Brothers and sisters, it has been said that the church is 20 or more years behind the rest of the world. We are slow to embrace the latest ideas. Because we are slow to embrace and try new things, the world sees us as outdated and outmodeled. While I do not discourage the necessity of wisdom in discerning a situation before diving in, I do believe there is more that the church can do to not only really catch up with the world and its problems, but to be ready with an answer, an action, an answer in action, before they even raise the question. Why? Because we have God. He is pouring down the answers. We are to be ready, but we're not just just stay with the world. We're behind the world. We need to catch up. We need to tap into that resource. The church is acting more like Thomas than it is the widow. We look at our resources and numbers and make the realization we are limited. Are we truly limited? We have heaven waiting to pour down in and through us to be a blessing to the world. God wants to do remarkable things in and through this, the church for this world. Yet the church and the believers who make it up are not living by faith. We are living by sight. That, this is not to say that we are not people of faith. Thomas believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and so do we. But just like Thomas, we are doing nothing until we see God's hand move first. When God supplies the funds or the, peop or the people or the resources needed to do a project, then we will work. No, that's hogwash. That's not to be the way of the church. We are to be a people of faith, and we are to be a people of wisdom and truth. So we should not just foolishly do things without checking our resources. Even Christ tells us that in Luke 14, when he told the story, suppose one of you 
wants to build it how? Why don't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. We must plan to see what we can do before we haphazardly begin a project and not finish it. But in the same mindset, God says, I want you to prepare for the blessings that will help you in that project. That's a lot of words. What do I mean? Let's give an example. Let's say the Lord has placed unanimously upon this congregation that we will build a temporary housing accommodation for those in crisis. Free of charge, but they, again, it's only temporary. They have to meet certain regulations, but it's still temporary. And we got this great vision. We see it because we see the number of people hurting. But we go, this is a great plan. We hear God speaking. But look at our numbers. Do we have the manpower to put it together? Now, how about our finances? Do we have enough to have someone build this for us? Or we pay someone to supervise this project? Not really. What other resources do we have? Maybe we can sell some extra siding that we might have lying around. No? Okay. Well, we seem to have very limited resources. But yet God has given us this plan. What normally happens in most churches is, that's a great idea. We will wish one day, no, God has given us this vision, one day it will come. And when God provides those numbers, those dollars, and those resources. We will build. Until then, put it in the filing cabinet and close the door. Nothing more, nothing else said. <clears throat> if God has given us a vision, should we not heed it? God doesn't just sit up in heaven, well, I got this fanciful idea just to see what they'll do with it. And toss one out left and right. He's given us a vision because he sees a need long before we do. And he is, again, the God who owns cattle on a thousand mountains, hills. He will supply. We, when we look at the, the need and when we look at the plan, do all we can to make it a reality. We may not be able to break ground. But we begin coning to find out exactly what is needed to build. What supplies are needed. How much it's going to cost us. And not only to build it, but to keep it going. Get all those figures. Check our assets. What do we have? Then, put our ear out. What other avenues maybe we've never considered before? The timing of this message is, is, is God. That's all I can say. Because, as some of you know, there was a grant given by the Central Region, offered up to start new ministries. We didn't have a plan. This grant slipped through our hands. The Central Region is not the only one. But there are other organizations. If they see a need and they are in line, can come behind us. Work with us to see God's reality come true. We do not have to do it alone. All that money, all that resources is God's. We just have to work together so we can start putting it together. Again, we may not do it right away. After all, God told Noah, build a boat. It's going to rain. Oh, and get all the animals on the world in the two. Okay, I got the resources, I don't got the animal, and I don't got time. Oh, don't worry, I'm giving you 100 years to build it. And I'm bringing the animals. Noah began building without a drop of rain in the sky. He was obedient to the vision. He did his planning. 
He did the work. And when the day came, God brought the animals and God brought the rain. And the world was saved. How can we help our world? Are we listening to God? And then when we hear God, are we acting upon it? Or are we just putting it in the file cabinet? Oh, we can't do it right now. We need to be like Noah. We need to be like David, who, even though he had a great desire to build God's temple, God said, no, that's for your son. Well, then I will supply all the need, the equipment, the material he will need. I will do my part so my son will have it easier. We must be proactive. We can't just sit around. We must be ready because God just doesn't give up idle visions. Yet we are asking God to work, but the church is not asleep. We have failed to meet with God or to see what his plan was. Or if we know his plan, we fail to believe we can do anything. Well, you're right. We can't do anything. God can. We rally behind him. If he says it's going to be done, we don't know when, we don't know how, but we trust in him. We will do all our part. We will put those timbers together to build our own ark if God calls us to. We will gather our containers to receive all the oil that God wants to pour down on us. But we've got to be going. We've got to take what God has given and not just wait until we have all the pieces of the puzzle together. Guess what? We will never receive all the pieces of the puzzle together until we're on the other side. I'm reminded of that every time I go to Mission Village and see the puzzles on the table. Because there's like three or four different puzzles and none of them have the same, all the pieces. You've got to figure out which puzzle it goes to. But that's how it is. God has all the puzzle pieces. He's just saying, use what's before you, work with what you've got before you, and I will bless you. In Josh, the book of Joshua, Joshua made a very profound statement, which most of us have heard, and it's impressed upon us. And it says, he said, before the house of Israel, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, I'm not as a great of a leader as Joshua. I'm a profound speaker either. But I have my own statement this morning. As for me and my house, the eight days of Thomas are over. We will prepare for blessings of the coming of our Lord. Are your eight days of Thomas over? Are you prepared for the blessings of the Lord? May this be your heart cry. May this be your lifestyle. Expect God 